learn to just eat shit, I guess, like all the time. <laughs> <laughs> That's all you have yeah, to do. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Cloud Machine Podcast. My name is Matt Landry, and in this 31st episode, I'm here with Abby Cassio. Throughout the podcast, we discuss her role as the executive director of River and Sky, this year's edition, her origin story, growing up in Sudbury, the art scene, and, and much, much, much more. We also play Dream Fest. Stick around, and thanks for listening. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Cloud Machine Podcast. For those who are new to the podcast, Cloud Machine is about the music industry and its stakeholders, meaning everybody that lives it, loves it, works in it, and surrounds it. Our goal is to shine a light on, on roles, people, and uh, the realities of the music industry that are often forgotten or taken for granted. Whether you're someone that's dreaming about making a move in the industry, have some songs recorded and don't know what to do with them, or just a listener that wants to learn more, you're at the right place. This week, I have the immense pleasure of welcoming a fellow Sudburian, Turn Torontonian that eventually came back home during the pandemic, Abby Cassio. Hi, Matt. Hello. <laughs> is that wrong? <laughs> no, no, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Sorry. Uh, she, she is a graduate of the Creative Industries uh, program at TMU, formerly Ryerson, uh, just like Chaboy here, uh, and has now become the executive director of my favorite Canadian festival, River and Sky. Uh, for more information to get in touch with Abby, check out her Instagram page at Abigail Cassio or the festival's socials at River and Sky and riverandsky.ca. So anyway, without further ado, please welcome Abby to the podcast. Woo! So hi, this is where I say hi, Matt. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. How are you? Good, how are you? Good, good, good. We'll start off the podcast like we start uh, almost all the other podcasts, except Paul's last week. Yeah. Um, <laughs> your favorite live show experience as a fan? Uh, honestly, any show that I've seen at the beach stage, uh, River <laughs> and Sky, has been one of, like... All of them are in the top, like yeah, all of them. And then also when I saw Telecolor Whoa. play at the dance stage back when we used to do live <laughs> music out there, yeah, that was a pretty insane, one of my favorite ones I saw. Hey, well, thank you very much. For yeah. those who don't know, I don't talk about Telecolor that much, but it's my hometown Sudbury band. <laughs> and uh, but even like at this at this year's edition of the festival, people were coming up to me and were like. Hey, are you that guy from Telecolor from that show in 2017? Dude, or that show was crazy. Yeah. Like, and the way we had to change the way we did that stage after because we had all of the like PA system facing towards the camping. Right. That time. So there was a lot of complaints. So we moved it this way, but it was like kind of at the bottom of the hill there. Like, <laughs> right. you were down there with like, oh, yeah. It was crazy. Yeah. It was crazy. Yeah, good times. Good times. Yeah. Um, as an organizer, promoter executive director now um what what is your favorite experience so far well of yeah just like maybe time. one show i know it's hard to sort of sort uh, of give it one show but honestly like watching dan romano this year was really good yeah and little mazarn yes like both times. I mean, in 2019, they played. Yeah. I was working for the festival. I wasn't the director, but they played, and it was amazing. And then that's why I brought them back this year, and it was, like, good this year, too. <laughs> it was so amazing. I mean, also, like, I watched Murder, Murder last year in 2022, but it was, like, the only show I saw that year. I was, I think, awake for, like, 47 hours at the time. <laughs> and I was like, I'm taking all of this off. And I literally <laughs> sat down at the front of the stage and like drank a Gatorade <laughs> while everyone was watching. <laughs> that was a pretty, that one was like, I would say it's good. I kept from what I haven't like blacked out from my like right, right, PTSD right, right. memories. But yeah. <laughs> moving on to the next question here. Um, it's all about Erica Badu's quote. I'll say it, I'll say it once, probably say it twice, but music and music business are two different things. Um, what are your ex instincts when I say that? Music and music business are two different things. Going into more of like the music business talk. They're completely different. Yeah. So, so, so different. I remember actually like when we talked when you were like considering going to creative industries. Yes, yeah. And you were like, okay, how much of it is hands-on? Because you were thinking about doing music yeah, at Concordia. Yeah, I did all my auditions. I did McGill. Yeah. I thought about going to Humber. Yeah, and you were like, what's the Boston? difference? What's the difference? And I sure. was like, you <laughs> know you have talent. Like, you know you're, you sure. can do the music part or find ways yeah. to do it, but you won't learn the stuff 
Yes. On how to actually use it unless you, like, I really liked the program. I convinced you to go. To yes. <laughs> no, yeah. I, I, honestly, yeah. I didn't remember that until right now. Yeah. That's great. We did yeah, have a yeah. lot of conversations. Maybe and, some Facebook messaging. Oh, for sure. Um, but yeah, definitely true. And like in both, like in music and music business, yeah, you just have to learn how to just constantly eat shit essentially <laughs> is my quote yeah. that i'm, go. that I'm gonna yeah. say quote it <laughs> quote Clip it. it yeah just learning to eat shit uh, <laughs> is the one thing that ties the two very closely together yeah yeah where are you at in the music business w what do you think 2023 uh, as well as like also all being a music consumer yes but also now being executive director of a festival where do you see the music business coming into play and the balance between the two because you're all you're obviously programming a festival but you also got to think about uh financials yeah. of the whole thing the programming the logistics all these things where do you think the business comes in and is it more is it is it is it more kind of prominent now in 2023 well it's definitely and i'm i can only really speak I mean, not that I can only really speak, but experience-wise, like, live music is mm. so much different than, you know, traditional recording music and, like, the yeah, actual yeah, music yeah. business. Sure, sure, yeah. And I the agree. way that they overlap is, is, it's just a little, like, I what I know about the actual, the music business is, like, from going to school and learning those kinds of things. Yeah, yeah. But, like, now living and working and trying to, like, figure out how we're going to do this like live music experience sort of thing, especially since the pandemic. Um, at first we were like worried people wouldn't want to come or people yeah. would be more or scared really, or like live streams and that kind of stuff was really starting at the pandemic. So not knowing if people were willing to spend the money to like come out and experience something. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, but what reigns true is that, um, People love live music, and I think it doesn't matter if it's for majority of people, even if it's not your, you wouldn't sit and listen to it in your headphones. Yeah. People enjoy live music. Yeah. Do you think that the, your festival, River Sky, has um, an advantage in being an outdoor festival in regards to, like, safety and, like, space and, like, just... Like, COVID-wise? COVID-wise, yeah, yeah. or, like... Yeah, yeah, you know, sick. big something sickness yeah. wise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, absolutely, and that's why we were actually the um, first festival besides the Calgary Stampede in in Canada to go forward after the pandemic. Oh, okay. Because uh, we did a small one in 2021. Yes, yeah. like a reduced one that was just two days, and at the time there was no rules yet from the province. Right. So we had to just spend <laughs> so much time figuring it out ourselves. Right. And we managed to do it without, I guess, we were worried about a super spreader event and nothing yes, happened. Yes, yes. Um, and we kind of, well, I heard from other folks that, like, it helped give them a blueprint of what to do moving forward. Like, Northern Lights was able to do an outdoor thing and then up here was able to do one that right. year as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, fully outdoor, like, they didn't have any indoor programming. Right, right, right. Um, because we were able to do it without a problem. I think if we did it and there was a problem, it would have changed too. But yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was the thing um, that we were able to do, and it's definitely been helpful. I mean, you're at the whims of the weather, that kind of stuff. Yes, yeah, Being sure, off -grid, sure, sure. All that matters, but the... The biggest thing I think that River and Sky being where it is and outdoors that is a benefit to me is that I have the freedom to sort of book what I want and yeah. what our music committee wants and more so submissions of people because I don't necessarily have to rely on the name of it, like a drawing a crowd with the big headliner. That's right. Because that's people right. come either way. Yes. People come and right. we consistently hear, I think people expect to find new music. Right. At River and Sky as yes. opposed to being like, I'm going to see so-and-so right, 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 whatever, right. just a festival where are you. Yeah, for many, the programming comes almost second to just the hang and, and the, yeah. the, the the environment that, that you allow your, your, your festival And I honestly to, really to have. heard like we have... We've been doing, we do satisfaction surveys every year. Yes, yeah. And just consistently, it's like, and people discover their new favorite artist most yeah, of the time. Yeah. 
And I think that's what people enjoy. Yes. I think people sometimes want to be in a world where you have so much choice. Like you don't even watch. No one watches TV. They pick what they're watching. They're told what to read. They're told what to look at. It's like being able to go somewhere and trust that you just know that you're going to like something yeah. is kind of freeing for people. Totally. No pressure as well. Yeah. And, and you and don't have to be like. Yeah. No research. No, you don't there's have to no do, like Spotify algorithm telling sure. you what to like. It's yeah. me. It's me telling yeah. you what to like. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah. Great. Where do you think the, the industry is going in regards to maybe even live music, but just in general, like after, you know, this summer or, you know, with AI, even all oh, these things. That's well, the AI stuff's terrible, I find. <laughs> yeah. And it's not hit really music yet. Yeah. Like right now there's the strike for act- actors and Sag or whatever. Yes. SAG. And, uh, but it's coming for like, it's going to come. Yeah. But it's like, I don't think people understand how badly the people at the top don't want to let go of their money. You know what I mean? Yes. Yeah. How badly they want to keep these, keep going up and doing the divide. And so it sounds crazy to think AI will design buildings and AI will make music and AI will do, do all the things that we went to school for. Yeah. Because people would rather do that than pay someone. Yeah. And it's, I have no idea how it's going to affect us. It's actually like mind boggling to me. I can't let my mind like think about what AI is going to do because it's like, it, it it just already feels out of control a little bit. Yes. And so, but I mean, music industry wise, like, I don't really know. I think we're right in the like full, full throttle, like midst of Spotify and streaming services mm-hmm. and all these things, um, like affecting, negatively affecting actual musicians. Yeah, sure. Um, you think it's going to get better? I don't know in what way it will change. Like, I don't know how... I don't know. I don't, I honestly don't think it will get better. Okay, it's never sure. been good. Like, yeah. in the history of music, there's always something in the music industry. Yeah. Like, it's all about the people at the top of the money. Yeah, yeah, And yeah. I don't know, And but it's that way in general in life all over. Sure. Like, to the point where literally our world is, like, boiling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I don't know how it will change, and it's sorry to be so bleak. That's <laughs> <laughs> fine, it's fine. But, like... That's why I fo- I like the live music industry. Well, yeah. Because it's just like happy. Yes. You know? People come. People always want to be entertained. That's right. People and- always want to hear, like, feel the music. Yeah. You can feel it, mm. you know? Like, I don't see live music going away. No, that's what I mean. it's such a human experience. Right? I don't think you can replicate it. Yeah. Like- uh, your origin story. It's it's funny because I haven't really had anybody um, from Sudbury on this on this pod. Oh yeah, um, eh? I guess because even Paul is is he's not really from. Yeah. He's not technically from Sudbury. Yeah. Yeah. Southern Ontario man's yeah. Sarnia, um, <laughs> really far. <laughs> yeah, yeah, really south. Yeah, yeah. Where did you grow up, and what was like the musical upbringing? Sudbury is where yeah, I grew yeah, up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, my parents are both very musical. Yeah. Like guitar, piano, and they were very young when we were born. Like my, I think my brother was my brother was born. My mom was like twenty three. Yeah, and my dad was twenty five, maybe. And they were essentially kids. Um, and so the, where I grew up, grew up, like my parents' friends were around all the time. Yeah, and they were having parties all the time, where it was like not without us, you know, like I'd fall asleep on a pile of coats, like beside my dad while he's like playing guitar and singing Him and my mom are playing guitar and singing. Um, and so it was always like a big thing. Like, I don't remember my house without music in it. Mm. I, and I still can't like, my dad's crazy ADHD like I am. So we always had to have sound anyways. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah. Yeah. But, um, and then we were like, you know, encouraged to play instruments when we were young. So like I started playing the piano when I was like three. Yeah. We had a piano in our house. We had guitars. We had mandolin, like the ukuleles, mm-hmm. stuff like that. And 
you know, my si- siblings took lessons for piano, and I did for a while, and I, my brother's seven years older than me, so from what I can remember, he always had a guitar in his hands. Right. Know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I started, I got my own guitar when I was, like, six for Christmas. Like, sure. It was always just very important, and it was always, like, a whole family thing. Like, to this day, we all still, you know, play and sing together. Yeah, yeah, whenever totally. we can. Uh, and then, yeah, even, it's just funny, the different kinds of music that you're, like, yeah, exposed uh, to. Exposed or? to. Yeah, yeah. And even like my grandparents' house is was all old country all the time. Right, right. On right. this old, old radio. Yeah. For Elvis. <laughs> right. Like my sure. papa loved Elvis. Yeah. And my you know, class it was more classic rock, like seventies, sixties, seventies music. Like my parents were not into the like grunge in the 90s or like new right, music right, right. and so and it wasn't like we didn't have a choice <laughs> right there right. was no like listening to kids music or like yeah yeah what I oh would my want. Gosh, yeah. like we would have to fight to go watch like mtv <laughs> like videos in the basement like at night when no one was trying to use the tv sure or sure sure yeah, yeah, so yeah. it's funny how it like Im- imparts itself onto you yeah because yeah. i never really liked pop music yeah uh, I can like appreciate it, right? But yeah, yeah. Well, you just grew up here. We had a family ca- camp, like a cottage. We still do. My dad lives there now. Yeah, he's like a guitar collector, so he's got like <laughs> yeah, he's got a bunch. Oh my god, guitars! Where I'm like, you love that thing more than me. <laughs> right, 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 right. Yeah. Okay, but great. Yeah. Uh, what about? So where did you go to high school? Lockerbie. Lockerbie. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. I went to a couple different schools actually. Like I went to. Marymount, yes, for grades yeah. seven and eight, yeah. and then I went to Lockerbie, and then in grade eleven I went to Subsec for like a couple months. Okay, and then I switched back to Lockerbie. Okay, <laughs> and I, just because because my I was really into visual art at the time. Yeah, uh, and my art teacher at Lockerbie, so Subsec's the art art high school. Yes, yeah, and I got it like I was double majoring in vocals and visual art. Okay, but. They were putting me in a year, like a grade 10 art class, because the way the schedule was right, when you right, switch. Right, right, right. And I couldn't play hockey. Like, I couldn't play the sports I wanted to play, because when you switch schools, you can't do that. Right. And um, the other classes, I just found, like, like um, Lockerbie's, like, the science, science was, was, I don't know if it still is, the science E school. So yeah. I found, like, all my classes, and I was really into science, like, kind of shitty. Yeah. <laughs> um, and like the vocals class was good, but I was like my art teacher at Lockerbie like taught at Subsec for like 12 years. She was like okay. amazing. Sure. And uh, I just was like, is it worth it to go come here to learn to do this vocals stuff when I can't like join the band? I can't like play yeah, yeah, yeah. this. I can't do that. Um, right. So I ended up going back to Lockerbie and I could like join it. Like, it didn't count as switching. Right, right. Again, it was just like, I hadn't yeah. joined any teams of any kind or whatever. So right. I went back and like finished out my like my high school there. Yeah, or yeah. Whatever. For a year. Yeah, it was in grade eleven, I think. Right. I did that. What was like the the, the 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 discovery of the creative industries program for you and coming from Northern Ontario, going to Toronto, like that sort of journey from yeah. when you applied, when you graduated when you went to Toronto, was it like sort of like this massive discovery? Did you know, like, I have some friends that knew yeah. like years before they applied to, to, to CRI that it would, it existed. I, I only no knew idea. like in January of my 12th grade, grade year. I had no idea about it. Um, I was very much like going to take neuroscience, science, like sure, yeah, medical yeah. biology. Uh, I like, did music, I did art, but I didn't f- wasn't ever like a job. Right. I was like, I can't go. I didn't want to do visual art in university because I was like, I don't see myself. Like, I can't become. A, I didn't know where you go after that, and I couldn't teach art. Right, right. Because I don't know how. I just literally sure, sure. started doing it. Right. I don't know how to like verbalize or teach someone else that it's same right. sort of thing for like because I was playing. I was playing at the time, like, the piano, the violin, the French horn, 
um, like I played a bunch of instruments yeah. at that time. And I was like, I also can't see myself wanting to do this in school. I just had this like <laughs> feeling about like I needed something where I could do a job. Right. And I was like the first one in my immediate family to go to university or to move to, to even move out of town. But at the time I just was like super into science and uh, had applied for like six neuroscience programs. Right, sure. So I like got in and I got into all of them too. Yeah, yeah. Um, and at Ryerson, I had applied for medical biology. Um, and I got in for early acceptance, yeah. like based on my science grades. Yeah. Um, and it was around October or yeah, yeah. No, sure. November or whatever. No, okay. I found out I got in early acceptance in December. But I was like going to for something in the guidance counselor's office and I was like having to wait. And my actual guidance counselor was such a dick. Like he <laughs> yeah. he was like not very nice. So I was always waiting to go see this other one. Right. And so I was sitting in there and um ended up like just leafing through like a literally a Ryerson brochure. Right. And I saw creative industries. And I took like three weeks I was thinking about it and I was like, I don't know. And I literally didn't know even very much about it. And on the last day that you could like apply through that website that we use. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. I like UAC. paid at oh you yeah. Yeah, yeah. I paid extra. Shout out. Oh you oh, yeah. <laughs> that, that thing. But I um I applied like the last day and it was like over the amount you could apply. You know, there's like a certain yeah, yeah, amount, yeah, yeah, so I yeah, yeah. paid extra and I was yeah. like convincing myself like just in case just in case yeah and so then yeah i got in for neuroscience like at all all these schools yeah in december and i was like not hearing about creative industries not hearing about it sure sure and i was like i wonder if it's because i have this offer from medical biology at ryerson sure. so i declined it yeah and then like the next week i got the offer for creative industries okay and wow. i did it and everyone was my in my family was upset that I was moving. Right, <laughs> sure, sure. My sure. dad had already told all of his friends that I was going to be a neuroscientist. Sure, <laughs> sure, yeah, yeah. Now it took him like till last year to be like, no, what I even went to school for. Yeah, he was always be like, he'd always be like, what is it that you're doing again? Like, how many times did you hear that too? Yeah. Oh my gosh. A hundred that, million times. That's the that's the whole thing too when you come out yeah. of first year at Creative Industries. Are like everybody will be asking what you're doing and you don't know. Yeah. And yeah. so and then it just worked out and I ended up really loving it. Yeah. And I, you know, I never even took business in high school. Like I really wasn't. Right. Me neither. I was not into business. Like, yeah. It I wasn't even an option not. in the French world. Oh, really? Yeah. I'm French still, people are like. French, business, French people don't know business. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or just, yeah. They don't do business. But I like never thought I would want to do business. I never, I don't know. I just, it, the courses seemed cool. And yeah. I was like, whatever, I'll get a degree. And we'll go from there. Um, but it was very much like if I didn't open that brochure sitting in that office, yes. I wouldn't have even known to look for it. Right. And I think when I started, there was no graduates yet. Like, that's how new it was. Yes. There was only three years of studies. So when I was in first year, yes. it was the first time we had a fourth year class. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So like first started, graduating class is 2017. Yeah. Your and first I went year. in 2016 is when I started. Yes, yeah. exactly. So... Yeah, there was no way that I was, and I wasn't like looking at that kind of stuff, right? Either. Yeah, I was very much like a mindset that I think has changed now. Yeah, where it was like you got to go do that, and that's how you get a job. Right. Science. Yeah. The whatever. Totally. I was in the same boat. Yeah. I, I did. I like applied for like business at Ottawa U, and uh, I, I applied for. Um, Some music ones too. I remember you talking about Gordon music Gordon ones. Maybe. Yeah, um, there was um, like uh, engineering at Laurentian. Like yeah. I got, I got it like instantly. Oh my God. Same thing as you, like yeah, science, it's a great math, weapon, yeah. science, math, nut in 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 in, in yeah. high school. Anyway, but I remember being on the couch here and, and my mom being like, "Wait a second, what's this program at?" Your mom uh, found uh, it. Yeah, 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 uh -huh. yeah. Because yeah, yeah. we were talking about like, okay, but is it just music? performance that you could do in, in university are there well, other things yeah are there are other options yeah there so. wasn't really besides no, yeah. creative industries yeah. there was like an arts administration program at toronto u of t right that was like sort of similar but it wasn't really right and like creative industries i found out after i was 
and I don't know about right now, but at the time was the only program of its kind in North America. Yes, yeah. Um, yeah. And I didn't know there was like such a wait list for it and like a low acceptance rate. Yes. And that like the yeah. acceptance average was so high. And I'm like, I literally got in here. Pure, like my average was garbage in grade right. 12. I got in here because of my science. Because I, I think because I like they had already offered something to me. Right, right, Based right, right. on those that like average. Right. So they were like, okay, here you go. Yeah. Like they didn't re-look at my stuff. I'm like, my science snuck me in because I wouldn't have made it. Yeah. I was below the the right. yeah, minimum average for sure. I think for me, the, the 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 thing about the program that sort of that I still think about today and so thankful for is that it was all good. It was academics that were into the arts. Yeah. Because of the high cutoff rate. Like my year was a 93 cutoff to get in. I think it, mine was like 95. Yeah. Something like that. Something crazy. So it's like, I, I loved it because it was, it was, it was young. It was kids basically coming yeah. into a new sort of space. Yeah. They love, well, maybe they don't love school, but they did well at school. So they, they could engage in conversation about. And I just Arts. found like the professors, like the people who they had teach were yeah. all like they weren't just people with degrees. Like no, yeah, half of them were just in industry fields. people who like are sharing their experience of 30 years of yes. of being in it. Or like the business course is even having a spin to them and it being a little more not so broadly like business accounting stuff yeah, yeah yeah and it being more like applied it honestly felt like like um half a half university half college like it yes. felt more yeah, yeah, hands-on yeah. i mean when i think about sometimes how long those cri lectures used to be i'm like that's a stupid university Amen. yeah Shut like literally up. all cri courses could have been one semester <laughs> all, all 400 of them. sorry to any if anyone's listening yeah yeah yeah, yeah. that could have been condensed <laughs> I'll stand by that till the day I die. But uh, I, it still was like, yeah. you're doing things. Yeah, yeah. Let me ask you this about the pandemic because you finished fourth year right when the pandemic basically hit. Yeah. Does did the pandemic have an effect on you coming back home? I honestly had no idea what I was going to do. Right. After school. Yeah. And in August, in April, mm -hmm. it started, and the teachers were like, would get on Zoom. <laughs> They'd get on Zoom and they'd yeah. be like, they didn't know what was going I'm on. so sorry. Yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. And we'd just like do nothing. Yeah. Like I don't think like, I, I didn't write an exam. They got rid of all exams. Sure. Yeah. And um, that's true. But I mean, yeah. like in February of 2020, uh, I got the River and Sky job <laughs> as the director. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. And essentially how well, I was going to ask you that because we're yeah. going there now. Yeah. And I mean, you could do that job remotely. Like you could have right. for sure, but I was going to come back and I didn't know how long I was going to do it for. Essentially what happened is like, is that, that I can get into this now. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I'll do it. But like Peter who ran the festival, um, for, he founded it and ran it. I think it, at the time then it was like 11 years. Yeah. Um, he had gotten a short term contract with, Canadian Heritage Fund, which is one of our funders. Right. And so when he had a short-term contract, he couldn't work on River and Sky right. at all. Of course. Yeah. And so he was like just getting back into the swing of things like in January, starting to do some stuff. Um, and I was on the music committee and stuff. Like I had worked for him the year before. Mm -hmm. uh, and they offered him a full-time job. And so it was kind of like, I, it's, literally a conflict of interest to work on yeah, yeah, the festival course, and he course, was kind yeah. of like i need you to take my job please yeah in february yeah of 2020 and i was like okay well i am coming home for like who knows how long like sure 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 <laughs> like i decided to do it yeah um and then and, and what were thank those... god the pandemic happened <laughs> sure 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 <laughs> that's the one thing i will say yeah what were those conversations like in the beginning? Was it like, hey, do you think that you could be interested? Is it like, were you like a shoe in? What did you, did y'all talk? Like, I, did you talk about it beforehand? No, I, we hadn't talked about it beforehand. But I essentially, like in 2019, and that's where I did my internship. Was with right, this guy. okay. But I essentially was his like assistant. Right. Okay. And uh, to no fault of anyone, 
about the organization before or any of the staff at the time. Mm -hmm. um, it was just very disorganized Yeah, because it wasn't Peter's full-time job. Like he was a stay at home dad and never really got paid really very much, right. like nothing yeah, for yeah, a lot yeah. of years and then not very much. And so it's hard to put all your focus on something when you're having to try to like figure out how to literally live and like raise your kids. Yeah. Um, sure. So it was a big, big ass mess. Uh, in 2019 and I think that I I ended up doing a lot of things yeah and helping him a lot and doing a lot of the stuff that he he like that I do now yeah like for him just because I intuited it you know like I would do things and he would be like whoa freaking out and I'm like I did it already yeah, yeah you know yeah, yeah, and so yeah. that worked and he had said a couple things to me and I was like no I don't know because I I really it was like very stressful in 2019 yeah like I worked a lot yeah but yeah. I mean I'm used to it I worked in restaurants my whole life and that's a stressful environment sure, too. Sure, sure, sure. but I was like yeah I don't know we'll see and then I was like maybe gonna think about it yeah um yeah. and he did he like talked to me when I came home for Christmas and was like feeling it out, I think. And then yeah. was like asking about some of my, he was asking mostly about the grant writing stuff right. about it. And if we learned any of that in school and we didn't learn it, Not really. but yeah. we did do like organizational report writing as a course yeah. and essays and that kind of stuff. Um, and I also took, I also had a minor in English. Yeah. So I was like, yeah, I'm, I, I could do that. And he was like gonna try to get me Involved in the grant process, but things fall through when you're like both busy people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Living apart totally. from each other. So then I like said um, I would be interested, and then went to a board meeting that was on Zoom, or I'd called in yeah. or something, and everyone else was in person. And he was like, "I think Abby should take my job." And the board was like, "Okay, Abby, do you want to do that?" And I was like, "Yeah." And they were like, okay, we're voting it in. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. And I was like, just had gum surgery, I think. Like, Or I was in, oh, that's when I talked to Peter because I was in town because I had had gum surgery and I came home for a reading week in wow. February. And then this board meeting happened after and then the pandemic happened. And <laughs> I was like, so I guess I'm cancel canceling this festival. Then. Yeah. But I was honestly like, because of the fact that he didn't, he couldn't work on stuff mm -hmm. or spend as much time on it, as, especially right. because of his contract. Lots of things were not. Right. It, it, was, it was already been, in, in a rough oof, shape. It would have been so, so terrible. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it would have been terrible for me to like, ra I, I, I wouldn't have been able to execute a festival. Right. Sure. Because wrapping my head around the admin stuff was like a whole ordeal in itself. Sure. Like there would have been literally no time to yeah. do both and it would have been a disaster so the pandemic like obviously it was terrible but yeah. it was really good for me good good um <laughs> i think i would have quit if i did if the pandemic didn't happen <laughs> yeah so the people that don't know what river and sky is do you have like an elevator pitch <laughs> i do <laughs> uh i can't do it seriously no 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 well it's an elevator pitch of Writing, so I'm sure, not going. Sure, sure, I can't sure, do it because sure. I'll just laugh. Yeah, yeah. But um, <laughs> River and Sky is a we're a not for profit arts organization, um, which I think some people don't people don't understand what that is. I think yeah. people don't understand what how not for profits work or what they are. So we're ta we're we're a, like incorporated business mm. that's not for profit. Yeah. So we can still make profit. It just has to go back into the business. Yes. Um, and so. River and Sky Music and Camping Festival is just a uh, extension program of. that we do. Sure. It's something that we do yeah. uh, as an arts organization. I hope we can do many more things now. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah, 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 yeah. That's the goal. Right. Um, but the festival is, this was our 15th year. It essentially was born out of Peter, the uh, old director, wanting to have like loving live music, loving camping finding this place and like really loving river Valley and wanting to have like music and seeing if people would pay to help fund the music, come yeah. and play 
And it was like uh, his birthday. Like it was like a birthday thing. <laughs> like his birthday is during River and Sky. Okay. Every year. That's um, amazing. <laughs> yeah, it's July 18th. That's when it starts. Yeah. Um, so that's how it started and ended. I'm pretty sure it just poured rain the entire first year. Uh. And it was like friends planning it. And like the first two festivals. So it was like 2009, 2010. Yeah. 2011, they became a not-for-profit. They incorporated. Amazing. And then that's when you have a board and all that stuff. And uh, it's just turned into, went from 100 people maybe to almost 4,000 people this year who come. started as a one-day weekend thing. It's now five days. Yeah. And we found uh, our forever home at Fisher's Paradise. <laughs> yeah. uh, so it's a... Yeah, we use about three acres of land. We're on the Sturgeon River. We're on an Oxbow Lake. Lots of people don't have service. Yeah. And we have around 45 to 50 acts come and play for us. And there's swimming. There's a sauna. There's kids allowed. All ages, vendors, workshops, the works. Um, and it's kind of like reconnecting with nature and community because yeah. you don't have your phone. You don't have mm -hmm. whatever and you, and it's fully camping. Yes. So there's no power or anything. Like I have yeah. to bring in all the power. Yeah. And for those who don't know, River Valley is between Sudbury and Sturgeon Falls in, yeah. uh, in Northern Ontario. It's in field technically. Field it's, but, Ontario. Yes. Um, it's right, right between Sudbury and North Bay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we have a lot of people from both and people involved from both cities and yep. music from both cities. And essentially it was like also like our mission statement is yep. like presenting arts in nature. Yes. In a sustainable way. Right. Like leading towards sustainability. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like emerging and we have like a mandate to, to have emerging Canadian artists. Yeah. As well. Amazing. You talk about the first couple of years, other than the, the length of the festival in regards, in regards to days, um, what are the like the biggest differences from then to now and getting into this year's edition of the festival? Well, pretty much it was fully volunteer ran. Right. For yeah. so many years. Yeah. And when we became a not for profit, it was easier to get grant money. You get grant money as a not for profit. But all of that money went towards, like, making River and Sky, like, audience experience. Yeah. It essentially went to, like, the bands, doing things in the community, like, making that outdoor kitchen area, building the saunas, doing all that. And um, no one was really paid, really. Like, yeah. It was just volunteer volunteer stuff. Yeah, Peter, yeah. Peter did everything. And, um, and we were able to get some funding for summer students. For maybe like the last eight years. Yeah. And they would like take care of the venue. Like we prep the whole venue. Yeah. yeah. We have groundskeepers as well, like in conjunction with the owners of the venue, the fishers. And yeah. so um, the biggest difference is now we have like operating funds yeah. to pay people to spend uh, more time actually doing it. Yeah. You yeah, know? yeah. Sure. Like, the first time my position had a salary was 2021. Wow, okay. I got a Trillium grant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ontario Trillium Foundation grant to fund like a, an actual salary. Right. Um, Because it was always like just trying. It's always a game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To yeah, get yeah. the money. And with that, I was able to not have to work like work other jobs, as many yes. other jobs. Sure, sure, sure. And I was able to get funding through another granting body called Northern Ontario Heritage Foundation Corporation. Yeah. And now we have, this is our second year with two full-time staff members who have a salary that's fully Amazing. covered by them as well. So this Shh. is like, the difference is it was just people yes. working together trying to yeah, yeah, yeah. do it. And now uh, there's like a reward for the work that you put into it, which is that you don't need to, your whole entire focus can go to it yeah, yeah, without yeah. having yeah. to like worry about literally totally. like li just living. Yeah. yeah, I got to give my perspective on this year's festival edition because I've been attending the festival for what, seven, eight years now. Um, it just it just felt like it was, you know, yes, organization is one thing, but the feeling of everybody um, on staff, but also the volunteers, um, it just felt like it was more that you could you as a staff volunteers could like enjoy themselves a little bit more. 
and be a little bit more stress free. And it, it was felt in the in in the people that were also attending as well, and the yeah. artists and everything like that. Um, so congrats on that. Thank you. Um, what are your thoughts on on this year's edition of the festival compared to maybe even even just last year's? It was just worlds different and almost everything I wanted it to be. Yes. Because there's always more to do. Totally. But, like, hearing that from you, and I've heard it from other people and other attendees, yeah. people who I know, where it was like they enjoyed themselves more seeing us also enjoy yes, yeah. ourselves. Uh, that is all I wanted. Yeah. Really, that's all I wanted. Because I worked, when in 2019... The volunteers, some volunteers worked like 18 hours. Sure. And I worked, I think, 140 hours in a week, you know, with some of the other staff. And we were struggling. We only had, we lost like 100 volunteers. People were not wanting to come volunteer because. It was too much. It was too much. Sure. Um, and through like the small pandemic festival and then last year, having really good people working for me. Uh, like Bailey and Lane, who worked for me. Bailey's a volunteer coordinator. She, like, we really focused last year on making the volunteer experience, like, good. Right. And I think last year, that's what I'm proud of about last year. Right. Is I know for a fact that volunteers had a good time. We had a terrible time, mm. the staff. Yeah, 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 yeah. I slept for two hours over five days. And, like, that's not good. Right, you know, right. like, I think that sometimes, especially in, like, the hospitality industry and then the music industry, like, yeah. live music, there's this idea that, like, oh, yeah, like, you got to be the type of person to work here because it's a lot. Like, it's, you have to be able to just hustle. And it's, like, I see that, but I don't think that's the way. <laughs> like, I, I get it. It's not the way. But no. I don't think that's the way. And I yeah. don't respect that like you can't ru you can't run people dry yeah because then there's no sustainability and mm. if you care about the organization that you're a part of you need to be able to have it like grow and change and move and sustain yeah and so when people are just overworked it becomes impossible yeah, like, yeah, yeah. it just becomes impossible and so i spent me and lane and bailey because they were my thought they were my first full-time staff and yes. Lane went to creative industries as well that's right but um we just spent all the year trying to find every little thing we could do and little process to put in place to make it so that it made more sense mm -hmm. and people could feel good and there was like a plan set up in terms of like all the responsibilities there was not gonna be any surprises right and my biggest thing is when people feel like autonomous in their work and like they can confident to make decisions yes. where I'm not micromanaging them. I yeah. think people do a better job Yes, and yeah. they just need to know that I'm here to support. And I think that that is what the kind of relationship that Bailey built with the volunteers and that we, I built with the staff and we built with each other. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was expecting the shoe to drop every day of the festival and it didn't. And I was, it felt like four years of work, like finally seeing something. Yes. Seeing something. And not to say I didn't see something before. Yeah, it's yeah. It's just like, it's hard to explain. I was very overwhelmed. Oh yeah, <laughs> so I, the crying of the fest. I was crying. Yeah. Oh my God. And I was like, grew up in a family that was like, you don't cry at work, you know? Yeah. There I am. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone I see. Yeah. It just hit me that I was like, it's not a fluke that it's going well. The shoe isn't going to fall. That's right. And everyone is having a good time because you, like it was just allowing, um, um, honestly, maybe that is the moment my imposter syndrome left me because I was like, this is because you wanted it to be this way and you've picked these people to work for you and they're great and the volunteers are great. Yeah. And everything's everything is good because you wanted it to be that way. Mm -hmm. And it worked. And you can feel proud of it and happy about it and not like Yeah, allowing yourself. And like allowing myself yeah. to feel these things that I don't know. Yeah. I 100%. just was so overwhelmed. 
by uh, and relief, you know, relief. <laughs> just leaving my body, the stress leaving my body through my tear ducts. Yeah, yeah. Or something. Yeah. Like I was just, anytime I saw someone, I was like, <laughs> <laughs> and it all started with Little Mazard's like performance. Yeah. And honestly, Saturday night. It's also started, Peter was like, said he was proud of me. And like, and Peter is, he's been, he's always very helpful over all the years. Yeah. Giving me advice, doing things. And he said a lot of really nice things about me to other people. Right. But he never really said. To you. To me. Right. Like, not sure. explicitly. Right, right, right. You know right, what right. I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind of yeah. like my dad. <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> hey, oh. My dad's the same way. And, uh. <laughs> Shout out dad. So then when he like. <laughs> and he didn't have to do anything. Like, him and Lara didn't have to do anything. Right. And, like, they had to do a lot last year and help. And they volunteered. They're, they're lifetime members. Yeah. So, but they always ended up doing things. And this year, they they just enjoyed it. And for them, that's, like, 15 years. You know, yeah. like, for me, it's yes. four years. But for them, that's 15 years where they're, they're able to, like, let go. Yeah. And enjoy the fruits of their labor and yeah. not worry about it or have to jump in and fix things mm. and that was like that meant so much to me and there was a moment where peter was like this is what i uh, always wanted give me a little hug and i cried and he had a little cry and i was like <laughs> <laughs> wow that's amazing <laughs> but there is still lots of stuff to change and fix still always yes there always is but and and if you can if you can say some of those things like what are some still some of the things that even from a great edition of the festival this year are there still things that you want to improve I'm, i mean obviously with every edition of everything there's always stuff to improve but are there things that like stick out still yeah i mean we like our programming i think is good yeah. i think that we've had solid programming so that's not a thing that i'm worried about uh but just different ways to engage the volunteers like i don't want them to start feeling run down either yeah uh better food system set up like for feeding because when you feed like when you feed 300 people for five days that's like two three thousand meals yep you know like making that stuff run a bit smoother and for the artists you mean uh, no, for the volunteers. Oh, for the volunteers, volunteers yeah. and artists. Just like certain things about the uh, accessibility of the festival is a yeah. big thing that I want to change. This year we had three folks who were able to attend the whole festival in wheelchairs yeah. and walkers. And it worked to a degree. Yes. There's still things that need to be set up. Like I just wanted to make it more uh, accessible in like traditional accessibility ways but also socioeconomically more yes accessible because yeah. if you don't have a way to get there if you don't have camping gear if you don't have this that and the other you can't come and so that alienates like younger people newcomers to the country yes people who are like a, a, yeah so, so socioeconomically lower on the on this the poverty scale yep. and it's like i don't want anyone to feel I just want it to be more open in that sense. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know? yeah. All that kind of stuff. And then just like certain processes of things. and mm -hmm. But you can put your finger on it. Like it, before it used to just be like, what is right. wrong? Are there things that are coming up like for the non-for-profit that people can be expecting in regards to some more activities for the, for the, for the organization? Or yeah, I mean. Fundraising, but there are there also like non-river and sky programming things yeah i mean i would love to be able to <laughs> yeah. now that we have more time yeah well honestly i feel good now that we have more time because on like last year so grant writing this is the thing that gets me is that people think that i just like do this for the summer you know? right right they're like oh you're doing that again this year <laughs> i'm like yeah it's my full-time job yeah because i run a entire incorporated organization yes yeah and that it's like you you have to report and budget and apply for grants and bookkeep and yep. do your year end and do all the things that you have to do and it's like that's a that's a lot. it's a lot of work it's a lot and yeah. and i know people don't know like it's not their fault that they don't know yeah but i just get frustrated sometimes i'm sure i've come off like rude but i'm like no 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 <laughs> yeah. it is just because you feel like you're working and working and working and you don't see 
people don't even know what you're doing for your job. Right, right. They don't know what it is. Well, and of course. they don't see it. So that that's part of why I, I cried this year. Right. And if people only see River and Sky as a festival, when that's... When that's just like an offshoot of this. It minimizes the, the, yeah. the, the, the organization. It's not like a, a no shade at all to like for-profit festivals. That's their only thing. Or DIY festivals that are... That is like thrown together by people who are just like out in the shit like yeah, getting sure. money. Uh, but it's like we... We do this year round. Like I start planning like now, you know, right, right, and I have right. to do reports and and yeah, re reconciling and all these things and just being able to get grant money. Like last year and the fall, yeah, I was spending most of my time trying to figure out how I was going to pay myself. Sure, because like my grant was up, I yeah. didn't get the same grant, and a lot of the other not for profits in Sudbury can access the city of Sudbury for their arts and culture program. And that's how they get their operating funding. Right. But because we, we operate in Sudbury, but our main thing happens in fields. We can't access that money. And right. West Nipissing is a small community. They don't have the same resources that Sudbury has. Yeah. So what we've been having to find other ways, other ways to get administrative funds, like operating funds versus project funds yeah. versus capital. Right. 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 And, um, the goal now that we're more settled because I did find a way, but I only found out in January that I was going to be able to be paid. Yeah, yeah. You know? Wow. Uh, with a grant that, like, we have a history of getting and they've changed it. And there's, like, more of a map. Like, I'm not so stressed out this time of year now. Right. So the goal now is to access different grants that I haven't or, like, research into them a little bit more Yeah. to see what we can do. And a lot of the grants are, like, the more... Uh, revenue you make like some of the grants match you they won't go over 50 right like they have to match they won't go over the amount of money you make right 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 because they match you right uh at most mm -hmm. so we've made more money this year yeah in lots of different ways that is actual revenue yeah and that opens up things for us um to actually start like being able to implement these plans and like i like the the we have these interns from nohfc yeah which is great but it's a one-year contract and you can't redo it right and it's really hard like i mean you did an internship i'm sure yeah. it was difficult four months is not a lot of time a year is not a lot of time yes yeah. to be an intern because you're just getting into things like i and you just agree. are getting somebody who's like you're teaching them and training mm -hmm. them and then they're gone yeah and it has to be someone new and so maybe we can get to a point where i can have full-time staff that are not just me year over year right? and can come back in different ways. Yeah, yeah. There's just like the ability to do those things now that yeah. I didn't have before that I'm excited for. And improve the, and improve the process for the for the organization and the festival year over year. So mm -hmm. if you know if, if if there's only one person working on it, well, it's 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 that's it's, literally it. It's 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 in your mind. You're, you're in your mind. You're you're not really it just lives like, and dies with you. Exactly. There's no dialogue. There's no team. No, I want my ultimate goal yeah. before I like move on because I'm not going to do this forever. But is like leaving knowing that it's set up yeah that anyone who with the credentials and with the passion and with the everything can come in mm -hmm. and do it right like i don't want to gatekeep right. information i don't want and look again this is no shade against peter yeah because he was just like in the shit yeah, 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 <laughs> learning yeah, yeah. to eat shit yeah, <laughs> like yeah, yeah. we do in this industry but yeah. trying to like get this trying to do this for the community Without getting without paid. Without getting paid while having his kids, while doing these things. Yes. Yeah. And so, and he's a type of person where a lot of stuff lives in his head. Yes. And so, it without trying to, he yeah. sort of made it where it was like, without him, this was gone. Yeah. You know? And I sort of had an insight into it because I worked so closely with him. And then I had the time mm. because of the pandemic. Yes. And so, it's like, if I hadn't agreed to it. I don't know if there would be a festival. Right. Because Peter needed to be able to take this job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, that makes sense. After putting all this work in year over year for like a decade. Yeah. That's the fruits of his labor is being able to get a job. Now he gives out grant money. He's a senior program officer. Right. He gives out grant money to organizations. Right. After Amazing. running one. Yeah. So yeah, it just was like I won't don't want any information to be like I don't want to know everything or be the only one who knows 
right. this was the only one who could do it. Like I want them to the whole organization to be set up for success no matter what happens. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's like the ultimate goal. That's why this year meant so much. Because yeah. Things were going, some things did go wrong or things, whatever, but everyone were, was given the tools to like make a decision in the moment mm-hmm. and handle it. Yes. And I didn't have to, you know, have my eye on everything or micromanage everything. Like you build a community of trust. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And someone else could come in and do it. There you go. And that's all I want. That's all you want. For the organization to be as old as Northern Lights. Oh my gosh. You know? Yeah. <laughs> 30 years left on that one. Yeah. Um, how far, so for those who don't know, for those who go, who ask you about what you're doing in the winter time or whatever, <laughs> can you take me through basically the process? Let's say, let's say like River and Sky, the festival's in J- July. Mm-hmm. Then what, what does the rest of the year look like? Let's say from like August of the year before to July. Okay. Yeah. Uh, typically. Okay. So August is a lot of, um, finishing paying invoices, but also finishing it's, it's okay. It's difficult because the festival happens in July. Our year end is in October, Whoa. but the grant writing season, yeah, like grants operate on a whole different. Yes. And every single one is different. Yeah. And a lot of them are based upon like when you're working for a not for profit and you don't have a reserve managing your cash flow is like, was what takes up my mind every day. Right, right. Essentially, right. because these grants are like you have to finish the reports <laughs> and the questions and all the things before they'll disperse the money to you. And they have they don't do it. It's not like a, a payroll payroll, you know? Right. It's like thirty thousand dollars at once. Right. And then for seven months till you're done doing the whatever's happened and you write a report. You don't get the rest. Yeah. So like last year, one of our grants, it, they gave us 30000 Then they were supposed to give us fifteen at the interim report, fifteen at the final report. Right. The interim report's due in June. Right. So I do the interim report, but because I have to show how much money I've spent, because I don't spend money right. till August, right. they were like, Zero well, money. I'm only going to give you $5,000. Right. Until you've spent some money and you can show that you did. And then on your final report, we'll give you the 25,000. Right. So it's a lot, it's like a balancing game. Sure. So in August, like most of the time I'm a lot of financial doing a lot of like reports yeah. so that I can get the money and making sure that I have enough money to pay everyone and be able to not have too low of an amount in the bank that yeah. something happens. And it's a stressful month, August. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> then September, it's sort of like, and in and in uh, the past for us because we've struggled. This is the other thing, and I, we, I was kind of um, scammed by our bookkeeper for like a couple, four years. Well, I know I haven't talked about it at all, and it's like I don't want to disparage her, mm-hmm. but I realized people on the board realized that for these these years, I was paying her. Uh, Four hundred dollars a month to do the bookkeeping, right. but I was just doing the bookkeeping myself, really. Right. And I was uh, giving her the numbers, and she was just putting it in. Right. Um, but then, so nothing was on time. Like we were behind on our year end every year. So until like even this year, I had to budget, apply for grants, and plan an entire festival with no year end of the year before. Right. So without knowing if we made money or not. <laughs> I mean, knowing, like I know, right, right, right. but that's but like hours or, and hours yeah, of sure. my time using what I learned from Brad and Master sure, yeah. when it's like, I should be, you should be done your year end, like <laughs> a month after, like you should be done everything a month after. Right. So like, we still don't have it. So then our AGM gets pushed and our annual general meeting gets pushed. Everything gets pushed. Yeah. Um, This will be the first year that's not going to happen finally because we figured it out. But essentially, yeah, September starts. There's a lot of like um, industry events like conferences and things. Yes. People going to things. And we start uh, finishing up our books. Yeah. Yeah. And they invite me. Yeah. And they have like a festival retreat. Yeah. There's like FMO I'm going to go to. A couple different things. Oh, yeah. And then um, October is like 
all the grants are due essentially. Yeah. Applications. Yeah. So like the applications for some of them are due before the final reports are due. And <laughs> yeah. So you essentially start, we start programming and seeking out like budgeting. We do the budget and programming before October apply for these grants. And then we start, um, finding the headliners before December because we want to put early bird tickets on sale right. in December. But then you have to figure out inflation and sort of get sort of what the cost of everything's. And then inflation's been crazy. Like yeah. what I applied for last year, I applied for some first things mm -hmm. and then food costs raised 12% in three months after that. Wow. So like you can't really know. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, you just, it starts in, it starts immediately. And then yeah. you are finalizing contracts in January, and uh, when I get a, and then January, February, March is when mm -hmm. you start getting grant notifications, like if right. you receive the grant or not. Uh, that's sort of when people we start really pushing social media and like figuring out what marketing kind of plan we're going to do. And meanwhile, the whole time you're also seeking sponsorships, in kind yep. sponsorships, and partnerships. Um, and then. Yeah, from December till the festival, you're selling tickets and tracking that. And that depends on how many, how much land we clear and what we do. And then I also can't go look at the venue till usually June because right. it usually floods and is terribly flooded. And right. we have to wait for it to go away to sort of see what damage is done. Right. And then we start Grounds prepping the venue. Yeah. yeah, like the river fell, like the road fell into the river this year. And we had to literally build a new road, like at one point. Um, and while all this is going on, there's like board meetings, there's like committee meetings. Yeah. Uh, we've never been able to really focus on fundraising and sponsorship stuff yeah. in the past, but we did this year. Like ideally now we're going to do like a shiver in sky again, right. maybe not in fields, maybe in North Bay or in Sudbury right. and other sort of smaller events. Our AGM can be in person. That's an event, you know, stuff yes, like that. Yeah. Um, but planning all that and like also doing all of the f like financials consistently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Around. Yeah. Um, the mo the, the, honestly, it is the cash flow part that's the most difficult because you have to kind of know what what time the money's coming in and mm -hmm. what time people are looking for money. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then it's a lot of like from now till. April, like listening to music, <laughs> you know, booking bands, <laughs> sure, negotiating sure, sure. with agents yeah, about yeah, contracts yeah. and mm, yeah. finding people to volunteer recruiting. Yeah, volunteer recruiting. Starts sure, now, yeah. like vendor, like vendor, vendor stuff. Like stuff. that was a little bit later this year, but like ideally yeah. that'll be posted and ready to go in like January. Right. Workshop stuff. Right, 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 right. right. Then we also also have to like find a designer to do our branding for the year yeah um like right now it's a lot of like going through our satisfaction survey responses yeah getting all the photos set up and a plan ready for like our uh, marketing and communications for the year right and finishing up like we have sponsorship and funder requirements mm -hmm. where we have to like prove yes these things yeah, yeah. and it's developing a new sponsorship plan developing a new this or that um yeah. Great. Yeah, it's a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Any, like, a couple tips for an, uh, an executive director, but also somebody that's stepping into a new role that's very important to the organization? Because whether or not you yeah. like it, it was a very big role to step into yeah. right out of university. Yeah. Uh, I guess the biggest thing that I would say is... Um, well, and this is like in life in general, I guess, is just <laughs> being honest yeah. with other people and yourself. Yeah. So I was honest about, you know, what I learned my, if I was interested in it, what sort of experience I had. Yeah. And they chose to hire me, right? Right. And it's like, if you're honest with them, you can trust that they hired you because they think that you're going to do a good job. Right. And when you need help, you just ask for help, you know? Like, I, I'm not going to say fake it till you make it or any of that kind of rhetoric because 
like I said, I had imposter syndrome. I still do a little, but right. trusting yourself, like if you are honest and straight up and like say when you need help and do the things that you need to do to communicate with everyone in the organization, yeah. um, you can trust the choices that you're making. You know, mm -hmm. like building a trust in yourself and like realizing like, okay, this is what I know and this is what I don't know. How do I find a solution? Right. And how do I, who can help me? Mm -hmm. And just being like, this is what I think needs to happen. And when you have a win, like celebrate the win. And when you mess something up, like be accountable and just learn from it. Like... Mm -hmm. If you're young stepping into a position, there is going to be, and especially as a woman, there is, like, people who just won't like you or won't take you seriously right? or won't give you the time of day. Yeah. And so knowing in yourself, not, I just don't like the being like, okay, just fake it till you make it. It's like, no, no, know it. Like, for it, it's true. Yeah. You know? You got you got here because you should be here. You didn't yeah, 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 you yeah. didn't fake it. You didn't like and the only way to do that, in my opinion, is to just be as open as possible, as communicative as possible. And so uh, you know, you're gonna have people who are maybe it's gonna be really hard sometimes who won't take you seriously. You just have to not doubt yourself through that and uh, learn to just eat shit, I guess, like all the time. <laughs> <laughs> That's all you have yeah, to do. Yeah, <laughs> yeah cause there definitely has been times where I'm like, like if I question myself and I ask for help and I still question myself, then it's like, maybe that's not the best idea. Yeah. But if you question yourself, you get a little insight and you feel better. It's like, trust yourself and do it, you know? And don't like not apply for jobs because you don't have experience. Literally, dudes, like white dudes, I'll say, yeah, just like apply for jobs that they're just so not qualified for. <laughs> They'll just like, I'll apply, I'll apply, I'll do it, I'm gonna do it, and then they get the job. It's like <laughs> you should be do that, sure. you know? Sure. Like, don't be like, oh, I shouldn't even take a chance right. to apply for that because I'd have four years experience, not five years. Right. It's like there's a there's a guy applying for it with two years experience who's like charismatic and whatever, right. charms his way, and he's going to get the job. Yeah, yeah, Just sure. do it. Like yeah, yeah. embody that white man energy sometimes mm -hmm. for your benefit <laughs> as a like woman or non-white man. Like, yeah. I don't know. That's my advice. And uh, yeah, just... Learn to enjoy a shit sandwich. That's it. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> and we're back. It's Abby Cassie on the uh, 31st episode of the Cloud Machine Podcast. Ayo. Um, Abby, we're, we're about to talk more about Sudbury. Um, mm -hmm. It was a goal of mine to talk uh, about a little bit more about Sudbury in the modern times with Paul, but it was it was way more about the history of, of it all. Um, yeah, and he knows a lot. Oh, <laughs> he yeah. He knows a lot about it. Oh, yeah. Um, he spoke more about 80s to 90s, but I also wanted to talk to you about, like, the, the cultural explosion that I felt in my teens. Like yeah. The 2010s, 2020s now. Um, tell me about your experience, like, then, as, as a teenager in the city. Of course, um, you know, I, I always associate you with even just seeing you at the front of the line for, for like, shows like, with, like, murder, murder shows. Yeah. With Haley. Um, for those who don't know, uh, Sam Cassio. My brother. Yeah, Abby's brother is, uh, I guess, is, was, yeah, it, I don't murder, know. murder. Yeah, they were, <laughs> done, like, on a hiatus yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Uh, and I spent, like, I don't know, eight months convincing them <laughs> yeah, yeah, to yeah. play at River and Sky last year. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, you can't say no to me. I'm your sister. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and then they played a couple shows. Like, yes, the, the townhouse show. Yeah, and I don't think they're doing anything more right now because a bunch of them have kids like yes, little kids yeah. now yeah but uh yeah it was a part of murder murder there you go my favorite band yeah <laughs> yeah yeah so tell me about that like just like now teens and just about the city because i i feel like it, and especially also for, for you coming from cri living in toronto for a bit um when people don't necessarily know what i'm talking about when i'm talking about sudbury the, the, yeah. the art scene here 
What do you, what do you like? What what's your pitch? Just about Sudbury. Honestly, I I feel like the art scene and music scene in Sudbury and like the downtown scene is um, kind of special. Yeah. Like I don't know how you felt in Toronto, but I found like because of the size of everything and I don't know maybe it was just there's so many different pockets of like music scenes mm. in Toronto yeah. which is cool but like it, in Sudbury I find it's like it doesn't matter what kind of music you play or what kind of what art you do like sure. everyone supports each other yeah um and it's like pretty actually vibrant Hmm. Um, and it especially was like when I, like you said, like in the 2010s. Yeah. When I was younger and I had like friends in high school in bands that were then playing the townhouse and like had to leave after right away. Yes. Because <laughs> they weren't of age. And like I, because I worked there, would get like, I'd put an apron on and like pretend I was working when I was underage to go see shows I wanted to see. Right. And they also did a lot more all age shows. Yeah, yeah. Like, all around. <laughs> That's true. The, in the Clean Drake era. Yeah. So I like. I think that I had an idea for what a bar show scene. Yeah. Like instead of it being like the Sudbury Arena or going to a stadium in Toronto. Yeah, yeah. Like you got to see, like. Townhouse shows, like asylum shows, like that big Whoa, basement yeah, show yeah, 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 yeah. that happened. People had backyard shows. Like yes. in the summer, when we when it's summertime, like in Sudbury, people take advantage of it because yes. we have so many months of bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> so like the amount of like outdoor shows I used to see. And then just like in my family, like uh, we would do a lot of playing and singing and everything at my camp, like I said. And we had, it was like a group of people where my best friend, her dad is my dad's best friend. And we right. have another friend who has uh, had, like, a lodge. Like, he used to run a hockey school. Yeah. Had a lodge. He turned it into, like, a place where there'd be, like, lodge parties. So, like, I, like, the Blue Rodeo was there, like, right. just hanging out. Right, And right, we were, right, like, right. playing around with that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And just, I think, see, I don't think some people don't have that experience. Yes. Yeah. I don't mean that experience in particular, but like being able to go to shows, having it be open. Uh, like Paul did a, the, the thing that I've never seen anywhere is that the townhouse used to have programming every single night. Yeah. Every single night. Yes. It was like a thing where you were waiting for like the month schedule. The townhouse calendar. The townhouse yeah. calendar. Yeah. And there being like something for everything. And even if you were like young, you could find a way to still see the show. Right. And like you could go in at 8 p.m. and have dinner and just not leave yeah. and see the I've show. Been there. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we've, yeah, we've all been there. Yeah. Yeah. What do you feel about now? Because we talk about yeah. teens, Abby going to shows, and now yeah. the townhouse doesn't have that no. everyday sort of programming. No, um, no. Um, yeah, and I would say, like, the best time was when I was, like, 19, yeah. 20, coming home from university and having all these shows. And, um, yeah, they stopped doing that. Before, I think they might have even stopped before the pandemic. Yeah. Um, but, honestly, it feels, like, a little sad yeah. to me uh, because there aren't... Like, the townhouse was sort of the only venue yeah. downtown for that kind of stuff. And the not having music every day has just changed it a lot. Like, it's not very populated anymore. Right. Like, you used to know you could go to the townhouse, like, at any time. And unless it was, like, a Monday or Tuesday, it'd be a little more dead. But, mm -hmm. like... There was probably something going on. Someone you knew was there. Yes. Yeah. Someone was hanging out. Someone was playing. Working or something. Someone was working or playing. Yeah. Um, and it just doesn't feel that way anymore, really. Yeah. Uh, but the and maybe it's a like maybe it's the pandemic. Like who knows? Maybe it's a mixture of that. Yeah. But I'm. Uh, it's been really good having the lounge. Yes. As a place, like with Brian Dunn running it yeah. as a like 
musician. Yep. He takes really good care of the artist. Mm -hmm. Like, he makes it worth their while no matter what. Yeah. And is constantly trying to bring people here and book people here. And that's been really, that's been awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's just a little, it just feel like a nostalgic, like sad sort of feeling in that way. Where you're like, like my cousin turned 19 and it was like not the same. You right. Know? Or like my 16 year old cousin who once is not doing that. Like right, we right, snuck right. her into murder, murder at right. Christmas. Sure. Which was like the one thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. She used to work at the Buddha too. Like we right, <laughs> didn't right, right, that. Right, right. But yeah, I don't know. How do you feel about it? Like. Yeah, well, here I don't live here anymore. Yeah, so that's that, that 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 there's a thing, but it's hard to know. It's hard to know because of the pandemic, and right? Like, yeah, but I don't know. For me, it's it's, and even talking to Paul on the weekend, and this episode, Paul's episode will come out next week for mm. us, but it'll be already be out when this comes out. Yeah, um, is that I have a feeling that like the 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 young people need to carry it up. Yeah, because a lot of people. Like Paul's age, let's yeah. say, um, are now sort of stepping away. Um, now, again, you're a pioneer, or you're you're not a, maybe not a pioneer. That, that's probably no, the wrong word. I love that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but um, continuing the, the scene, and um, you know, like with uh, with Tessa at NLFB, mm -hmm. and uh, with Max still still doing the artistic direction at NLFB. Um, we're seeing a revitalization. Not that there was ever like a down. Well, there was like, for a little. Like, yeah. Yeah, I don't I, know. I feel like there was like, there's a lot of places yeah. that used to be part restaurant, part venue. Yes. That are not down. Right. The Red Fang is, is gone too. Yeah. And the townhouse is like, they don't want to hire someone to book. Yes. And because making because with skip the dishes and the restaurant they can close earlier and still make money like it's just not worth it right for them yes uh and then the other spots that do have music it's not really like the alibi is not set up for that right 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 and the grand is too much of a it's too big Right. You know, like, I mean nowhere is doing stuff yes yeah but yeah. i think that's a part of it is that it's like People probably need to get creative yeah, to yeah. do some shows. Yeah, I, you know, I, yeah. I just don't. Know. I just want to bring it up just because there's a lot of things that are that are happening. I just, I just feel like there needs to be more um, of, of of the people our age. Yeah, it's, um, what's hard is that like, like they approach. They had mentioned to me or asked me a little bit about booking the townhouse. Right, and I know they asked uh, Ollie. Yeah, I'm pretty sure, and uh, John Cosmo. And it just is like hasn't worked. Yeah. Because it's a whole like that was a lot of time and energy and work <laughs> yeah, that Paul put about. into that. And yeah. it's not worth it. Like when you have everything taken away from you yeah. with the pandemic and all you have left is food. Yeah. Really, and it still works. And it works. They were like Yes. This makes more sense. Right. You know, yeah. like I don't know if they're going to do the beer festival right. where they used to have stuff there. Yeah. I don't know. And I mean, Place des Arts is like a good place to have, but I don't know if it's like people are going. Yeah. Well, it, it, it's it, too it, much. Well, it doesn't cater to the every night. Yeah. Night owl bar person. Yeah. Um, so I don't really, I don't know. I mean, the, I'm hopeful because I know like, they folks bought like a couple of businesses opened up the new books and beans and the new night owl bar and they yes. bought like the Knox Presbyterian church and they're going to turn it into a venue. They actually, I almost, we almost had our office there. Yeah. Like a bunch of people did. It's yeah. not, we just have a pretty good deal. So yeah, yeah, yeah. where we are now, but, um, I wasn't sure if we were, we, we could talk about it, but yeah, I don't know. Knox, I think yeah. we can, uh, I think we can. <laughs> yeah. I hope I'm not in trouble. Yeah. Uh, I just know they're aiming yes. to have it be an event space. Yes. I think they're caught up because it's such an old building yep. that there's a lot of stuff that has to be done to make it accessible, like bathrooms and yes, that yeah. kind of stuff, because it's old, old, old. But yeah. that will be like, that'll be cool. Yeah, it'll be great. It'll be great. Yeah. I mean, it's just like they also have this supposed to be stage at the Buddha that's not being used. And I don't know. I, I just don't know... 
how you for like make it right happen right brian is really easy to just be like i want to do this right right can we do it he's down yeah. so can, i don't know can i ask you maybe we cut this uh, note yeah. here but can i ask you about like the whole up here thing that happened and what you think about all that stuff yeah As i guess an ED so of a you can. yeah and i don't know maybe you don't have to cut it um because i just had a i also had a different idea <laughs> Yeah. When I heard everything. Sure. So, you know, I heard everything and they posted. And For those who don't know. Uh, yeah, they up here didn't get funding. Right. Uh, from oh, Experience Ontario. Right. Um, and you know what? I wasn't surprised by that right. at the time because, and I did a rate, an interview with CBC and they misquoted me in the article, but like I used to get that grant too. Right. So there's the Ontario Music Investment Fund. Yeah. And then there's uh, Experience Ontario, which used to be called Ontario Creates. Yes. Reconnect Ontario. It's had a bunch of different names. Yeah. And in 2020, they made it so that you can't get both. You have to choose one or the other. And I chose the Ontario Music Investment Fund because I just had a better relationship with the program officer. I found the a- application process better. I just found it better. Yeah. Um, And Experience Ontario is is open to for-profit festivals as well. Whereas uh, our terms of investment fund is for just not-for-profits or charities. Yeah. So that's why I picked that one. And then uh, I had a, we doubled like the funding that we got through Ontario Music Investment Fund. They've been the best to work with. And I, at a couple of these like FMO things or festival retreats, I was hearing from different or Ontario festivals like Hillside, Mariposa, Blue Skies, like all these places. Yeah. Uh, that, they were promised the, from Experience Ontario that their funding wouldn't be cut, and then it was, uh, uh, not as much as it, not a hundred percent, right? Like this was, but so when I heard that they had their funding cut or taken away completely, I was kind of like, oh okay, like they are really cutting it. Like I had, I wasn't surprised because I had spoken to these other festivals, right? Who had also experienced it. Right. So I, you know, did an interview and was like. That's what they misquoted me by saying, like, I heard horror stories, so that's why I didn't apply for Experience Ontario. I was like, that's not at all. No, no, no. Yeah. Why? Uh, yeah. I was just, like, applying for the one that doesn't include for-profit festivals. Right. Seems and you like can only it made more for sense one. for me. Yeah, you can only apply for one. Yeah, yeah. And you can't even apply for both and see which one you get and choose. You know sure, what I mean? Sure, like, sure, sure. So uh, I felt bad. I was like, I'd also experienced this year from the federal government, like, a huge funding cut. Uh, to our Canada Summer Jobs yep. program that was like came out of left fields uh, that everyone sort of experienced. So I was like, okay, they're just cutting funding. They spent a bunch of money during the pandemic and now they're like, shit. Yeah. And cutting it. Um, but then when I found out that it was because um, their application was incomplete, um, I don't love that. Right. They, the way they portrayed it yes. uh, is not the best. And, you know, I've not gotten grants because I've missed something right. and completed something. Right. Um, what I feel bad about is, like, they're in, a, they're in a transitionary state. Right. Like, they had just their board for a long time. They became an opera profit. This is the first year that they've had, like, a general manager. Yeah. Which is... Pretty much what I do. Same thing. Yeah, yeah. Different yeah. title, same thing. And she only started in January. Yep. The grant stuff happens in most of the time the fall. I think Experience Ontario messed stuff up, and I think they had to apply in April. Right. And so it's like to have it where you're starting in January, applying in April, there's lots going on. Yeah. You know, just like it is a lot to do. So it's it not not completing it correctly is like a learning experience right you know where yeah. and they're just in their grow they're of growing pains yeah, yeah that's what it is totally and that part of it is like expected in my eyes yeah um and honestly even like rallying for money is expected in my eyes when you don't get a grant yep. but you the the rhetoric of it being like 
Yeah, we yeah. don't know why. Yeah, they just did this. Call Ford and all these things. Yeah, and call like, this or just those things where it's like I wouldn't, I wouldn't have chosen that. Sure. For myself. Yep. Uh, or a river and sky, and maybe it was an oversight. I don't know. Who knows? They yeah. are. I want to give them benefit of the doubt because of the growing pains mm. and because of um, trying to figure it out. Because yep. I know what that feels like. Totally. And I know, know Peter knows what that feels like. And I know mm. they know what it feels like too. But yeah, I didn't love that. I was kind of just like, ooh. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I it's think just it's under a different pretense, you know? Yes. Yeah. Like giving money to an organization for one reason when it's not the reason. Yeah. Like it's not to say you don't want to give money. Like I would want to give money either way to help them. Right, right, right. When right, right. your funding's cut. Right. But it, it should be, you would probably want to say, we didn't get this funding. Because we didn't because fill shit, the application. Like, you know, yeah, yeah. Yeah. like, or not even, you don't even have to say the application part. Just like some things changed, our budget changed, that we didn't get this funding. Right. We need your help. Yes, yeah. And yeah. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe the, uh, I'm a little surprised they, ex like, Experience on Terror responded because that's not typical for like a granting body to do. Well, no, it's it's because you they know? went public with it. Right? I know, and it's all it's like I don't know, I don't know. It's like a little icky feeling to me, sure. and I really hope it gets worked out and they can move past this. Yes, yes, thing yes, that yes, happened, yes, yes. But I, uh, yeah, I I wouldn't have done that. Right. I wouldn't have. It, I wouldn't have put that statement out if that were me. You're right. In and that I just, position. Yeah, I just wanted to touch on it just because it's something that's happening and just yeah. locally in the scene, but also just because I think we share some of the same sort of experience in that mm -hmm. in that in that sense. And it, it was sort of not the greatest feeling, but I'm glad that they're sort of moving past it. Yeah, um, I don't know what I honestly uh, yeah. only found out about it on Friday. Right. And then I kind of forgot about it. Um <laughs> Because yeah. I've just been doing so many things. Yep. But, uh, yeah, I don't know if, I don't know. I actually have to ha would have to look. I didn't even really read the whole, like, thing from Experience on Twitter. Yeah. I just heard about yeah. it. I sort of did. Yeah. And, yeah, again, like, would give them the benefit of the doubt. Do I, am I happy about it? No. <laughs> like, right, it's right, a little, right, I don't right, really, right. that's just uh, not best business practice and practices in my Yeah. A humble opinion. Yeah, yeah, I sure. Guess. Like, as as we start wrapping it up, um, there's a couple things to do here. But um, do you have a dream for Sudbury specifically? Because again, with last week with Paul, he always dreamt about making downtown better. And yeah. we, uh, we even with Rob Gregorini, shout out Rob. <laughs> we'll ha eventually have Rob on the podcast. Uh, talking last night about just making the downtown a better place just for, for business, but for people and yeah. uh, opportunity in the arts and stuff. Um, do you have a dream for Sudbury? Yeah, I guess. I mean, I really did feel like before the pandemic, it did feel because I worked downtown yeah. when I was like 13, mm -hmm. 14. I worked downtown and I saw what it was like. And it, so for me, by the time I was 20, whatever, yep. before the pandemic happened, it did feel like a huge difference. Right. There was more businesses open, like Good Luck and more restaurants. And they did that thing where they were doing, um, like, downtown Sudbury, the BIA. Yes. Yeah. Has done a lot. Yeah. And they, f and, like, Place des Arts coming. And then they, like, did that thing where you, it was like a window, a program for the summer where you could rent a window space, an empty window space downtown for really cheap. Mm -hmm. That was cool. Like it just felt on the up and up. And then the pandemic really, t it took a hit. Like yeah. yes, it was actually almost scary. Right. My sister lived downtown the whole time that was going on. And, mm -hmm. and I think it gave people more, the people who were maybe would come around, like more reason to not come around yep. and to keep, wanting to move things outwards, outwards, outwards. And I don't know if they told you and you like PLX one, whatever yeah, that, yeah, that yeah. Shout, shout out Eleanor shout out Ray. PLX, yeah. Um, <laughs> that Sudbury is literally used as the worst example of urban sprawl in textbooks. Yes. Yeah. Because it just makes no sense. Yep. And um, our downtown is trying as hard as it can, but we are not 
really set up for success from the beginning of time. Like, mm -hmm. name another city that's downtown. Like, we have 330 lakes, and we have nothing on a lake. The only <laughs> thing on lakes is private residences. Yeah. That this was a function of of people with money. Yeah. Like any other well, downtown, the mining too, Kingston, and all these things. Barry, sure. Perry Sound, any town, Belleville, like any town on the water. Yeah. Has their downtown surrounded by water. Yeah. Toronto. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. know, we we have 330 lakes, and there's not a single. Our downtown is by a, a railroad track. Right. And uh, and a, a mall that destroyed one of the most beautiful neighborhoods in Sudbury in 1975. <laughs> for to make that's now empty like it just is like it's so badly set up i don't know what could fix it right because bell park is owned by the city now yeah the city doesn't want to do anything really with it and then otherwise like nepawan ramsey all these lakes are just dominated by people who can afford to live on the lake right yeah and it's like you're we we don't have one restaurant overlooking Right. On uh, water? Right, like, right. <laughs> it just doesn't make sense. So sure. my ideal situation is like build that walking bridge to, that connects to Bell Park over the tracks like they've been talking about. When they build this whole new, like I just saw the panorama thing where the old hospital is. Yes, yeah. Like build that and put something else there There besides just the condo retirement. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. just maybe the city will see how good it is and some stuff can be reworked like yeah totally. i mean and i love the boardwalk but yes. it's like that was because the rich bell guy gave it to the city he owned all that land and he gave it away and the rest of it they sold for people to build houses yeah like he owned the whole thing pretty much mm -hmm. and so definitely like it's a long way i don't know what yeah, you can yeah. do yeah. It's, it seems like expanding the downtown sort of into the donovan a little bit like on kathleen with Beards, yes. Beards and yeah, yeah. Tuco's and Cosmic Dave's and Cafe Obscura and having even like nowhere be in that old uh, down on building. Mm -hmm. um, moving it a little bit is feeling like it's good. Yeah, I yeah, think yeah. that part's good. Yeah. I just would like to see a more walkable area yeah. of the city sure. and using the resources that we have to be able to, you know, Mm -hmm. have that kind of stuff and and like uh, all of this could only be accomplished if our like it's so many it's so deep deeply oh like gosh, disorganized yeah. and our city council like our city our wards are a part of it yeah like so much would have to change yeah. the wards would have to change the way that that like all of that works would have to change for any like actual meaningful change to be enacted yeah that it's like that would be the ideal dream, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah <laughs> that, yeah, like, yeah. a Zilda and Chemi and the Donovan aren't in the same ward. Right. You know? Right. And totally. then people who are, and that all these towns that were amalgamated into the city that got their government, their mayor, their municipality status taken away, like, that, I would be mad if I was them, too. Yeah. You know? Sure. Now you have someone who's living in the Donovan like making decisions for you. Right. And you have not and as much versa. funding. Like you don't, if you don't yeah. have a mayor and a, and like people in your town doing stuff for your town, mm -hmm. of course things fall apart. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why like Capriol, Chemi, Azilda, all these places are suffering. So like, ooh, maybe we change everything. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. I don't yeah. know. I do want there to just be like more vibrant, uh, I want people to to stop feeling so scared to come downtown. I want the people who are struggling downtown to have more options yeah. for help. Yeah. And people struggling with addiction or homelessness. Mm -hmm. uh, like the problem is, is you, they have nowhere else to go. Yeah. So what do you want to do? Mm -hmm. Like now you don't want to come here because of them. Well, then they need support. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. it's just so much. It's so much. Yeah. So much. <laughs> And we're back, everybody. It's Abby Castillo, 31st episode of the Cloud Machine Podcast. Last segment of the podcast here with the Dream Fest game. For those of you who haven't been watching the, the podcast, listening to the podcast, Dream Fest game is all about uh, getting to know the guests, sort of uh, what, what they would want to, to, to go see or, or if, they, if they could program a festival like Abby does in her, in her job, uh, what acts would they want to book if they had no budget, 
you know, and they could do anything they would want, dead or alive. Um, so I asked Ivy today to uh, come up with a list of a headliner, second headliner, opener, where the festival would be, when it would be, the attendance, and how Abby would put her own spin on it. <laughs> um, so what do you have for us, Abby? Okay, this is going to be chaotic as all hell. Okay, <laughs> um, the headliner? Yeah. Would be Elvis, but singing like a very specific time in life of okay. Elvis. Well, with him singing "Bridge Over Troubled Water" with like, well, I mean the one is with the LA Philharmonic, but like any kind of symphony. Yeah. Also playing "Bridge Over Troubled Water," and I would just stand in front of the speakers and <laughs> cry. Um, yeah. And I would probably get him to do that like. 10 times in a row. Um, <laughs> and then you literally just take requests from me. It's all That's the, the headliner. Yeah. Um, the second headliner is like, I want to see the band. Um, but like, leave on Helm. <laughs> this is, it's very specific. Yeah, yeah, leave yeah, on yeah. Helm, like, in his playing time, like yes. his, the way he drums, like his peak. Yeah. But like, the way he sang when he was a bit older. Okay. <laughs> I love old Leave on Helms. Yeah. Um, and like Fleetwood Mac would have to come out for like one song. Okay. Like together. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, and then the opener, <laughs> there's a theme here okay. of people just being at a specific <laughs> time yeah. in life. Yeah. So the opener would be like my brother, my dad, my papa. Yeah. My self, my sister, my noni who plays the accordion, yeah. my best friend Jordan, Lane, like Max and Spencer, but like everyone at prime times again. Like <laughs> I've seen videos of like my dad at 25. I mean, my dad's more like my dad. I don't mean my dad was prime at 25, but like yeah. I've seen my papa who's passed away now, like singing right there yeah, and playing guitar there. And he sure. lost his hearing as he got older. So I didn't hear that as much, but I did a little bit. Right. So just like everyone primed up but like and like my noni yeah. plays the accordion she was like a, she was like a good accordion playing champion or whatever okay. like, i don't know champion like <laughs> yeah. i don't know yeah, 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 she yeah. like played the accordion at the italian club and like was really good now she can't do it Amazing. as much okay just that kind of shit like yeah, i would yeah, want yeah. that and like all my friends playing yeah but like like all the murder, murder boys, but after they've toured for two years straight, so they're just like tight. Yeah. Like that's what <laughs> yeah. I want. Um, that's the opener. Yeah. Um, where would be literally somewhere in Italy, like at one of my, where my family lives. Like my aunt has a apartment like in Northern Italy, but on the ocean. Yeah, amazing. Beautiful view or my camp. Yeah. <laughs> one yeah. or the other, maybe yeah. we go back and forth. There um, you go. It would have to be in like the late summer or the fall. Yeah. Uh, and attendance, like only a hundred people I like. Right. <laughs> Very specific people. Right, 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 right. And the spin is that every set, like the headlining set, the second the opener yeah. is like long, like a day long. <laughs> the sets it's are like long. Day. Yeah. yeah. And there's like, <laughs> like the way it is at like a small bar where it's like, okay, I'm going to take a break now. Right. It's like what the break is like me and my family and Elvis and Levon Helms and Italy, like. <laughs> chilling for like a two hours and it's like hey get back to it amazing like that's the and that's day one right right, right 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 and it, you switch it's a hang with honestly music. it's like a big hang yeah. it's literally like what peter wanted was just a hang with music <laughs> right. and that's my dream festival yeah, yeah yeah but yeah we would have to listen to elvis sing for Trouble trouble water about 10 times that's in a amazing. row that's amazing that would have to happen yeah <laughs> hands down yeah, could yeah. be all three sets that could be all three full yeah, yeah. sets Just and i would be happy yeah. yeah amazing well that's how we end it yeah. that's how we end the end, end the app honestly i'm gonna have a hopefully have a dream about this later this yeah. <laughs> dream festival when i'm sleeping yeah yeah that's awesome Literal dream uh, but thanks for coming thanks for um, having me it's yeah. honestly so nice to see you yes it's been yeah. a, it's been a long time well we've seen each other a couple times couple over the times. years but mostly at the festival or mostly at the townhouse yeah and we're and listening to your brother we're like in Toronto when Singing. we were both in school. Oh, yeah, it's just like, then. it's been a while, you know, yeah. you forget how fast time flies. Yes. Yeah. No. So it's great. I mean, you great yeah. to talk about the fest yeah. and to talk about what, what the, the people actually don't see uh, yeah. of the festival as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Maybe people will think I have a job now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yay, exactly, yeah. I have a job. So yeah. again, thanks for listening, everybody. I hope that this, uh, this lawnmower is not lawnmower too terrible. Is not killing the episode here but um thanks again 
Uh, cl- keep on interacting, people. It's the 31st episode. I still can't believe it that we've 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 come this far. And um, it's great to do some episodes in Sudbury. Yeah. Um, and do a little bit of local family time as well. Um, oh, yeah. So thanks, everybody, again. And uh, stay safe. We'll see you next week. See you, everybody. Bye. Bye.